So I was glad to hear Jeremy talk about Peguvian taxes. Uh, remember the discussion we had many years ago, at the, right after the crisis, where we were, uh, Javier and I were talking about Peguvian taxation as a way to control the, the sort of money creation, uh, the uh, excessive mm -hmm. aggregate liquidity risk by the private sector. And at that time, Jeremy told me, you know, the problem is when you're dealing with someone who's addicted, you cannot just rise the price of coming into the casino. You just have to stop them at the door. So I think that's maybe the point of having quantities where you put limits to the exposure and maybe at the aggregate level or so. But if we, now if, and this is a if, if we've done enough of a good work in giving them enough buffer, or if we feel that we can track better the creation, then, um, then we can go back to a less dramatic and in fact more efficient, as you pointed out, system of managing excessive short-term creation in the private sector. The alternative is indeed to supply on the public side because I, it's clear that the demand is there. But uh, to the extent you want to divide a the task, then I think some instrument there, uh, such as liquidity tax, uh, would be appropriate. Is there a question? Oh, that's, not a question. that's not really a question, but Jeremy, do you want to comment? Or? No, yeah. but I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just use this as a quick opportunity to, to comment on something that Olivier said before, which is, I mean, com of course, completely correctly that, you know, it doesn't really make sense, even if you bought all this stuff about, like, maybe the Fed should do it or the Treasury, it doesn't make sense to think about a target for the size of the Fed's balance sheet. If you were going to get in this business at all, it would probably make sense to think of a price kind of thing, like, you know, let's, let's do it in your preferred world where the Treasury implements it. I'd say the Treasury should pay attention to the slope of the front end of the yield curve, and they should, you know, organize their issuance accordingly. But that makes much more sense than saying, I have a target for how many T-bills I'm going to have. Uh, you know, if they just think of themselves, if the Treasury would just think of themselves as basically trying to issue at low cost, but be a little bit more adaptable than they've been in the past, that might get you some of the way. But, but truly, I don't think a quantity target um, so would make a whole lot of sense. You, why do you think it's a good idea to go in the direction in which the Fed is going now, which is to reduce the balance sheet? Because you seem to be agnostic. I mean, there's still 20 basis points to be eliminated from increasing the balance sheet of the Fed. So we could decide that we're going to do it until the you know, Fed wedge is gone, yeah. in which case we should be increasing the balance sheet of the Fed now rather than starting to decrease it. Why do I think? No, again, I'm, my basic preference, all else equal, would be to have more, and whether it's the Fed or the Treasury, would be to have more uh, short-term claims in there. Um, I mean, that, that argument has been, <laughs> we, you know, the history, the sad intellectual history of this is we started actually with the Treasury trying to, trying to urge this. But, uh, but you seem to think that it's better if it is a central bank to do it rather than the Treasury. Well, you know, and I mean, if so, then I think you have to be agnostic as to whether the Fed has the sign right whether they have the sign right whether now. Whether they are decreasing their balance sheet, where they should be increasing it, because Treasury is not going to do it. Okay, so, okay, let's, 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 let's stipulate that. I don't think necessarily the answer was ever to get it to zero, because there's a trade-off. And so, you know, I think some of the slope right now, as you said, there's about 20 basis points of slope. I think some of that, uh, to, you know, to appeal just to the expectations hypothesis might get you some of the way. There's probably one hike at least baked in over the next six months. So, you know, my guess is it is flatter now and that there is some effect. I wouldn't want to overstate the effect. Um, and I wouldn't, given that the effect is not overly powerful, I wouldn't want to say that the job is to get it all the way to flat. But, um, you know, I would like to not see it reemerge with the, the sort of kind of steepness that you saw, saw before. Yeah, and if it were me, if it were me, I would be in much less of a <coughs> rush to shrink the balance sheet. You know, that's not, not my call. That's a, that's a fascinating discussion. I would just like to, to, to encourage you not to lose totally sight of the fact that central banks are also uh, in the business of doing monetary policy. Um, <laughs> so if there is anything uh, you would like central banks to do for financial stability reasons, you've got to explain how it squares with the monetary policy mandate. And I guess the answer then in your model uh, would have to be about the composition of the balance sheet, which is what, 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 what you said. But uh, uh, let's not lose totally sight of the, of the monetary policy discussion. Please. Any other question? Oh. Please. 
Let me ask the obvious question, uh, Elu Fontaine, University of Mannheim. Let me ask the obvious question to Jeremy. So um, if 4,500 billion is the right size of the balance sheet of the Fed, we clearly got it very wrong before 2008. And uh, so is there, a, is there a reason to assume that uh, the lack of regulation before 2008 uh, resulted in the private creation of those uh, short-term assets uh, in, uh, in a dangerous way, and could, by expanding the balance sheet before 2008 to 4,500 billion, we have avoided that type of private supply of short-term assets, which was dangerous. So is regulation complement to balance sheet size, or is there some sub substitutability in terms of uh, now going back to smaller balance sheets, as many people seem to want? So again, I, I think that this is very much in the spirit of Benoit's question. I think you know the, the pre-crisis thing was characterized by a combination of no regulation or inadequate regulation and a strong economic incentive to, to fund at the short end. And the right answer, I think, in, a, in an ideal world, you do the best you can with regulation. That's, in some sense, the first best instrument. If you think that it works very well and that there's no sort of evasion around the margins, then that's, that's it. If you're, and we don't really know yet right now, because I would say right now we've done the regulation, but the incentive part has not really reemerged. And again, we'll learn. We'll, we'll basically learn as the yield curve steepens. Um, I suspect, uh, just sort of you know, based on the fact that uh, there's regulatory arbitrage is sort of everywhere, that you know, the regulation by itself is, is not going to do as well as some complementarity uh, you know, between regulation and trying to keep the incentives somewhat moderate. Maybe to, to your point, Jeremy, maybe one additional remark is that the Regulation doesn't apply the same way to banks and non-banks, exactly. as we know. So uh, the, uh, exactly. the the constraints on the maturity transformation is not not as yet the same, uh, right. say uh, in the money market universe on the right. investment fund universe, even though the FSB is, is working on it. Right. So that's the, that would be the worry. That would be precisely the worry. The yield curve steepens, and we start seeing various shadow forms of uh, of yeah. maturity transformation. That's exactly right. Another question. Yes, please. Uh, it's uh, a question uh, to uh, Professor Stein. Uh, can you recall in your model uh, where the demand for a short-term uh, bond uh, from the private sector comes from? Um, is, it, uh, is there a friction, uh, a very high risk aversion, for example? And uh, if um, with the crisis, and now that the crisis is gone, uh, is uh, this friction gone? You know, it's a, it's a very good question, and there's sort of a deeper, deeper take on it. In other words, a superficial answer would be to say something sort of institutional, to say, well, you know, there's a lot of money market funds, and there's $3 trillion of money market funds, and so they need to have short-term assets, and there you go. Um, and then a, I think a pretty, you know, uh, powerful criticism of our whole, of, of everything I've been saying so far would be to say, you're taking all that demand as sort of given and in some sense as legitimate. You're saying, well, we should be sort of organizing society to sort of to accommodate that demand, either via the private sector or the public sector. But maybe that demand is in itself somewhat excessive. So just to give you an example, where's all this money market fund stuff come from? Some of it probably comes from all the cash that corporations have accumulated. That in turn has something to do with like taxes and repatriation and all of that. And maybe we shouldn't be doing all these gymnastics, you know, just to accommodate that demand. And the right answer is if we sort of did something with the tax code so that guys repatriated some of the cash, there'd be less cash and money funds and some of this demand would go down. So I think that's a that's a very fair point, and I think it's a sort of, it's related to Benoit. There are other instruments in some sense that one might want to bring to bear that would be closer to first best instruments than essentially implicating the government in just uncritically um, accommodating this, uh, uh, this money demand. So I, I think that's completely right. A related point. There's an argument which has been made against, not Jeremy's uh, specific argument, but that line of uh, argument, which is the people have been, which have focused on the role of collateral and have argued that when the Fed does this, uh, 
it basically removes good collateral by basically holding it on the balance sheet of a central bank rather than where it should be. And I've, I'm not sure I can make sense of this because, I mean, the Fed is actually providing amazingly good collateral, which better. is money, except, no. except it's that it's in the, it goes to the banks and uh, people who need the collateral are not the banks, typically, uh, are not primarily the banks. So it's something interesting. I suspect it. The answer is that there should be a way of using cash as collateral outside the banks. And so I suspect that the way this liquidity is provided should probably be extended to more than banks, which would be the solution. But I mean, it's in, I mean, in a way, if I listen to the collateral argument, yeah. uh, I would conclude that what you're suggesting is completely wrong. Yeah, but I think it's not correct. I mean, it's a way. So, so let me just totally agree with one thing, which is he, here's, I think, an easier, lower hanging bit of fruit, which is whatever we agree the, the size of the Fed's balance sheet should be, I would prefer that the liabilities not be reserves, but be something like their repo. Right. You, know, you, know, uh, you mentioned central bank bills. Mm -hmm. you know, if we think that the world has a demand for safe short term assets, why are we creating all these things and saying, oh, only the banks can hold them? That just seems like it's a violation of every Friedman rule type of principle you would, you would want to have. You should make the stuff freely available to, to, to whoever wants it. So I always liked the RRP program uh, in that sense, and I would have loved to have seen them essentially put the rate on that higher, and so sort of th thereby you'd be using your liquidity a little bit more broadly, and I think that would, be, that would answer your point and would not make their footprint any bigger in the aggregate. But there seems to be, for reasons I don't fully understand, a bit of traditionalism associated with doing it more in the way of reserves and less in the way of, of, of repo. Can I just come yeah. in on this yeah. one, but sure. I, think, uh, I think this, um, these two comments, I think, raised a bigger issue of uh, um, you know, who should have access to, uh, to the central bank balance sheet. And, and Benoit, you're very familiar with this debate. Um, um, and one, one debate that's been going around uh, has been on uh, the, the role of um, central bank digital currencies, how widely they should be, uh, what, what form they should take, who should have access, uh, what's the elasticity, and so on. I think that uh, you know, raises a whole host of questions which have to do with the nature of intermediation, what are the financial stability risks during, uh, during periods of flight to safety that are going way beyond uh, the narrowly focused question about uh, yes. the, yes. uh, the uh, demand for safe assets. So I think we should try and um, you know, take a step back and take in, take in <coughs> the larger picture here and uh, uh, perhaps you know, pose this in, within a larger context. No, I am. I was going to say exactly the same as, as Hune, so there must be some kind of uh, central banking DNA somewhere, yeah. uh, that, if that if that becomes a broader discussion on who's, who's, having, who's having access to the, to the balance sheet of the central bank, um, then we should look it through. Um, we should look at the consequences for the future uh, of the banking system or the, the kind of financial structures that we want to see looking forward. And uh, sometimes I have the impression that we are we're jumping a little bit too fast to the conclusion that well, the banks are no longer performing the, the social role that we would like them to play, which is maturity transformation, because that's essentially the social role of banks. And so we've got to move on and write them off and move to something else. Uh, but again, that brings me back to, to my first question to Jeremy. That would be a little bit uh, a, um, uh, also writing off all the regulatory effort that we've been uh, having since, uh, since uh, 2007. So um, that might be the conclusion eventually, but... Uh, I would like to be sure. Uh, I would like to be sure. Uh, so let's give a chance to the uh, to intermediate finance uh, before we move on. Uh, Luc. Yeah. So there, there's another argument um, that you hear often, actually, around here that, that Olivier did not include in this otherwise, I think, uh, exhaustive list, which is that there may be such a thing as a reversal rate. So the idea of um, now, at some point, when rates are low for a prolonged period of time, it may um, actually turn out to be contractionary monetary policy because it basically uh, eats up the net interest margin of banks. So Marcus Brunemeyer, with one of his students, has uh, written down a model of that. And it's a bit unfair to ask the question uh, since he's not here. But it just more generally, I think this is also very much in the public debate. Um, so this is less the plumbing and the collateral, et cetera, et cetera, of what happens once we exit, but it's more sort of some of the impetus created 
um, in certain parts of society calling for an earlier exit. So what do you, as a group, kind of make of this, this type of arguments? Maybe. Uh, it's a macro I'm question. open to the idea that the sign of the effect of V interest rate, whatever it is, on uh, aggregate demand changes as you get to very, very low uh, rates, in which case it's not a good idea to do it. So I, the notion of a reversal rate strikes me as logically consistent and maybe even empirically relevant. Does this lead me to want to execute QE faster or not or increase interest rates? I'm not sure. I would have to look at uh, how, you know, where the adverse effects come from and whether they come from the QE part or from the policy rate part. And uh, I have not thought about that part of the answer, so I, I, wish I should stop here. No, I mean, I, I, I forget who mentioned it earlier today, but uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned the, the, the point. There's, there's sort of, if it goes negative, and then if it's just very low for very long, that the effect of, you know, the income and substitution effects may play out differently for a very permanent uh, change than for a short. I don't know that we have any evidence on it, but, but I think it's worth at least entertaining the conjecture that, you know, the, sti the stimulative effect becomes weaker over time because people start, start worrying about uh, saving more effectively. Um. Well, that's clearly something we're, we're looking into, but the, uh, so far it seems that the so reversal rate, and I agree with Olivier that it, th there has to be a reversal rate somewhere. The question is uh, how low uh, is, uh, is, uh, is it? Um, and the, so far it seems that it has to be either very low or low for very long uh, to, to materialize because there are cumulative effects, as uh, Jeremy just said. Um, and uh, when we look at the Eurozone today, uh, where the, the deposit rate, which is the main, the main policy rate uh, uh, in the current environment, uh, is, uh, is minus 40, uh, it seems that the, uh, so far, but again, so far, uh, the, the negative impact on, uh, in particular on, on bank lending of, of having a very negative rate has been uh, more than offset by the, by, the, by the general equilibrium impact on uh, aggregate demand, uh, demand for loans, uh, et cetera. So this might not be true eternally, and this would not be true if we would push the deposit rate much, much lower. Uh, but so far, it seems that we, are, we still have a comf comfortable margin. Can I just come in on this one? Uh, Benoit, I think uh, we, we had a very interesting paper uh, earlier in the day from uh, Glenn Shepens on, on uh, why the, uh, <coughs> at least for the retail deposit rate, uh, it seems that zero is a pretty hard low bound. And um, uh, I, I think a very um, interesting case study uh, of, of uh, where this reversal rate might be is just to, um, just to give it time and see what the impact of a very prolonged period of... Uh, of negative rates might be, because uh, I think it, it will actually have an effect on uh, on some of the structure of the intermediation as well. And I'm, let me just mention the experience that uh, that the Swiss um, uh, have had recently, which is that uh, there, what uh, what happened when the deposit rate uh, went very negative was that um, the mortgage rates actually went up um, because the the large banks were were able to um, you know you've mobilize their pricing power to actually, um, to actually raise the, the mortgage rates. But what we've seen, I think, more recently is that uh, as uh, the period of low deposit rates have persisted, the structure of intermediation itself has changed in the, in the sense that the, uh, the players that I talked about, the, the insurance companies, um, have discovered that you know, these, these very long-term mortgages have very uh, fixed income-like attributes, and uh, uh, it's the insurance companies who have also entered the mortgage market. Um, and then the, um, the initial pricing power that the, the banks thought they had may not be all that uh, lasting uh, after all. And so I think the, uh, where the reversal rate may be uh, depends not only on just a number, but also on how long uh, this, um, uh, this period persists. No, that, that, that's absolutely correct, but it, it depends, then it depends also a lot on the, uh, the, the kind of degree of competition that you have on the, uh, on the retail market, which is different in different country, countries. It's certainly different in, uh, say, in the Eurozone, in Switzerland, in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, what, we, what we see in the Eurozone is uh, we still have too many bonds. Uh, there's a lot of competition, so that's probably not the most uh, likely uh, negative, negative effect. Uh, 
So of course there is no free lunch. That also implies that the low interest margin uh, uh, means um, implies low uh, profits, which is less internal capital accumulation, so that might be an issue for financial stability over time, but it's probably more of a long-term impact than a short-term impact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Bert Sinental from UBS. Um, I was wondering, since the, 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 the title of the panel is uh, Exit from uh, Non-Standard Monetary Policy, and we've talked, uh, or you've talked a lot about the Fed, um, and, and I was wondering, I mean, the Fed has, has started to, to, to exit, um, and it has been going very well. I mean, uh, the, the curve has been very well behaved. In fact, it has flattened. Long-term yields are, 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 are low. Um, I, I was wondering, what, what do the panelists draw? What conclusions do you draw from this? I mean, does it mean that maybe the exit is actually not that scary as many other central banks, I guess, including uh, the ECB, the RICS Bank, the Swiss National Bank, particularly in Europe, where, where, and in Japan as well, where, where central banks are still engaged in, 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 uh, in, in these uh, non-standard monetary policies. I mean, it's, would it be correct, in your view, to, to draw the lesson that maybe, uh, you know, all this, all this uh, withdrawal of QE may not have such a negative impact in the end? That's a, that's a very good question. Let me just say that we're, we're not scared by, by exit. I mean, that's not part of the job description to be scared uh, by anything. <laughs> so we just want to do it carefully, prudently, and uh, in the light of our price stability mandate, so in the light of the impact uh, uh, on medium-term inflation. But I would be interested to hear the, the answers of the other panelists. I mean, I, th I think Hyun has it exactly right. I mean. You know, you can do the usual stuff and say, you know, all this has been telegraphed to the market, so there are no surprises coming to the market. So if the thing is sort of market expectations, we don't expect much. And if you ask me for a baseline about what's going to happen, at least with the Fed's wind down, I would probably say my baseline is, you know, it's not going to be a big deal. But we just don't understand markets all that well. Um, we are in a situation where, you know, some asset markets, if you look at like U.S. credit and other things like that, or at least, you know, valuations are at least moderately stretched. Um, you know, to say what the trigger will, even if you believe that you can forecast returns a little bit based on valuations, we know very little about triggers. But at the same, I mean, I would just be, I would be um, uncomfortable being overly complacent. And then I, I think Hume made some great points about the interconnectedness of all of this. You know, even if sort of, the narrow hydraulic effects of just the US, uh, the Fed shrinking its balance sheet, even if you think that those are sort of modest, I suspect that a lot of the low term premium and the narrow credit spreads that are in the US, for example, we've imported from Europe, right? And there are these nice, you guys have probably produced some of these charts where you, know, you can see the amount of, uh, for example, US corporate bonds that have been bought by European uh, asset managers, right? And so, there's all these kind of uh, flow type of things going on that I think we don't understand super well. So there's, there's got to be some tail out there. Again, I, it's different than making a baseline forecast, but. Uh. I don't think, uh, sorry, sorry. Maybe I think just one quick remark, which is I think the portfolios of the different bank, central banks are different. And maybe the exit from uh, QE from the Fed is simpler. Mm -hmm than it is uh, for the ECB, to the extent that you, know, you have uh, like the implications for fiscal positions uh, in various countries of the Eurozone are more complex than the implications of, for the fiscal position of the uh, US uh, government. So yes, so far so good, and clearly uh, a clear, uh, at least initial path, not final path, uh, has made an enormous difference, and, and things have been priced in nicely. But um, the challenge is still there, I think, for the ECB and surely even more for the BOJ. You know, I think it's very tempting to, um, uh, you know, reach for the textbook model where we have a single individual investor and you can sit down with the investor and say, look, and let me tell you, it's going to be very gentle. Uh, it's going to last uh, several years, so there's nothing to be afraid of. And I think that's the kind of uh, picture that we have in mind. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that's, that's certainly a... Uh, a, a possible scenario, but I think what um, uh, what we should bear in mind is that it's the market is a very complicated place with different uh, players with different motives, and I think it's um, 
it's worth thinking about how those interactions will actually actually play out. Um, the you know one thing that we do know from the from the academic literature is that uh, bond markets do overreact relative to the expectation theory of the yield curve. And uh, there's a very interesting paper by um, by Jeremy's um, colleague uh, Sam Hansen and David Luca and Jonathan Wright, which have looked at the recent evidence on uh, bond market overreactions. And what they find is that the the frequency and the extent of that overreaction uh, has uh, increased markedly since uh, the year 2000. Now, um, I mean, you could say, well, you know, we shouldn't really worry about this because it's just a short-term, um, some you know, short-term effect in the market which will die down, and that was certainly the the experience we had in 2013 with the taper tantrum. I think the difference, uh, perhaps, this time around with the taper tantrum was that in 2013 the backdrop was still very uh, accommodative. I mean, there was the uh, central bank asset program uh, in the U.S. just uh, uh, um, you know backing up. Um, this time, if if the if the broader backdrop is less accommodative, then uh, I feel like the, the final destination may be somewhat more uncertain. And I just go back to my previous point during my uh, during my introductory comments, where uh, you know in textbook comparative statics exercises, if you have a demand curve that slope that that slopes upwards, as well as a supply curve that slopes upwards, um, it's uh, depending on how you draw those curves, you could certainly have multiple equilibria. And you know that may be one one kind of scenario where uh, everything makes sense, but uh, it's uh, it's very difficult to uh, to foresee you know where you'll end up. And I think this is another um, instance of the old adage that uh, you know in finance it's much easier to talk about uh, consistency across assets at a moment in time uh, than to think about the intertemporal consistency because. The intertemporal, consistency, uh, the intertemporal consistency may be, uh, you know, much harder to to achieve because, you know, uh, there is much less arbitrage um, going on across time than you have across uh, any any single date. And so I think this is something that uh, um, that is food for thought. And I know that, uh, and we are sitting in front of uh, people who have really contributed a lot to this literature. So maybe we could uh, we could ask them at the end of this panel. Monica, I think. We're, we're looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem so eager to, to answer. <laughs> you want to answer? No. No. No, um, no uh, two things. I mean, first, I think the, the, the point uh, uh, Hune just made and, and made earlier in our discussion on, on granularity is very important. If you want to understand the impact of whatever we're doing um, on market prices, uh, you've got to be very granular. It's not always about... Um, different um, political structures, which, which Olivier mentioned, and that's important. Uh, it's also about different financial structures and different uh, people holding the bonds, right? So just to give to, to illustrate, uh, Hune, you gave the example of, or you flagged the risk of rates, long rates going higher, uh, insurance companies or pension funds marking uh, down their liabilities and then dumping bonds and have, having some kind of uh, convexity there. <clears throat> which, which is clearly uh, something that, that's possible. What we've seen so far is exactly the opposite, that us selling, uh, buying, buying bonds from uh, investors who are increasingly buy and hold investors, increasingly regulatory constrained investors, uh, putting a higher price uh, on the bonds because of the, uh, of the regulatory constraint, um, meaning that uh, that has contributed to the, uh, to the very low level of long-term rates or we've been able to inject a, a higher amount of duration for a given a quantum of, uh, of purchases because of the nature uh, of the investors we, 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 we had against us uh, and the, on the other side of the market. So, so you've got to understand all of that to, to understand the impact, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult looking forward. Okay, may I ask you a last, one last question because we're coming to the end of the discussion. Um, the discussion has been very much about balance sheets, volumes, not that much about rates which is, of course, an important part of what we're doing, forward guidance and all the like. Uh, and there is one striking difference, or striking to me, between the, the, the US and Europe, which is about the, the end point, the terminal rate. So Fed has communicated quite a lot on their expectations, or FOMC members have to communicate on their expectations of uh, long-term uh, interest rates, or the long-term value of interest rates. So easily. So you, you have a fairly good uh, notion of the distribution of the terminal rate uh, in the US. 
and that's not something we're doing. Um, so is that important as a as an anchor, or how, how much has this contributed to the uh, to, to stabilizing the exit process? Well, I think it's. Uh, can I maybe maybe I could uh, start with this and um, and have it and hand over to the other, to the other panelists. I mean the the uh, the famous uh, dot plots, the uh, the summary of economic projections from from the FMC members. I think is. Uh, uh, is something which is very widely, uh, which, which is very closely followed, um, and yet it's also an instance of, uh, you know, one comment that I made earlier, which is that th there does seem to be something of a gap between uh, what, um, what market prices are signalling as to as to what the future conditions will be, and what uh, um, we know is coming up, in that uh, the market implied path of interest rates seem to be somewhat different from the from the summary of economic projections, and I think it's, um, um, I, th I think it will certainly have a have a value. But I think it's also, uh, um, um, I think, illustrating that uh, if it's a forecast um, and it's filtered through the market process, so it's not simply a, a statement about uh, uh, one's intentions, but rather it's a forecast that's uh, filtered through whatever economic model one has. Uh, the signalling value of that may be. Maybe less than you know, um, maybe less than four. And I think it's quite telling that we do see this wedge between between the uh, the market implied path and the and the dots. Ravi, you've been you've been disclosing your I've been a dot. Your dots, um, your dots. Uh, uh, you've been a, a dotter. Yeah, a dotter. you know, I I have to say. Uh, you know, I, I obviously I understood the theory of forward guidance. You know, the, the sort of strong form forward guidance at the zero lower bound, where it's more than just you know this is my best guess. Where it was at least in our case, it was a quasi commitment. So that that I think you know, those textbook, and I, I think it was the right thing. Away from the zero lower bound, I understand a little bit less well what the role is, and I have to say I have a little bit of discomfort because I worry. I mean, I worry that you could get into a situation where. It, 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 it basically con confines your ability to move when you need to. Now, obviously, the Fed has not had a problem not meeting its guidance when that not meeting it has been going slower than the market expects. I wonder if, if there comes a time when they need to be more aggressive than the market expects, will they feel sort of somewhat constrained or reluctant because they kind of put a number out there. It's like a you know corporation that puts out earnings guidance and then feels it has to meet or exceed its guidance. So. A little, you know, away from the zero lower bound. If you could kind of make the dots go away, I think it's a good, it's a debate worth 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 having. Um, and this is a <coughs> this is a long discussion. What the terminal rate is likely to be. My own view is that my own distribution has a much larger upper tail than the than the market. I don't know where I would put the dot if I was allowed to put a dot. The dot might be in the same place as the others, but the distribution around it would be very large. Love that. Because yeah, I mean, that, the, the more I, the, exactly, yeah. that's something on which I've, I've worked, which is where, where do the low rates come from? And if it comes from a decrease in the rates of return in general, and then if you think about the reasons why, the reasons we give from the global savings lot and all, it's not clear it will remain, or it comes from a safety discount, and there you can tell stories where it will also largely go away. So my sense is uh, people, I mean, the market seems to be expecting very low rates, and I expect, well, at least I think there's a risk of much higher ones. But I've said this for three years now, and I've been wrong, so. Yeah. But, that, but that, by the way, that's exactly where I was coming from. Not that my point estimate is all that different, but I think there is that tail, and you want to be, if that tail manifests, you want to be able to do what you need to do. And I just don't know enough about how the market will behave, but I worry a little bit that once you put this marker down, it's a little harder to, uh, to react if, that's, if, if, that, if that turns out to be the case. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm not going to attempt at uh, summarizing the whole discussion. Um, the, uh, the conference reconvenes tomorrow, 9 a.m., to discuss globalization, uh, inequality, and welfare.